Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. And lovely to be here. I studied in Nottingham, so just down the road, know the area well. Um, so I made a very bad call this morning. I thought what I'd do is I'd ride to the station in the morning. I've got a very reliable bike. Haven't had a puncture for about six months. It was still dark, and of course I got puncture. So there was me by the roadside, shining my front light onto me, trying to change this puncture. And I made the train with like one minute to spare. So don't come too close to me, would be my advice. <laughs> okay, CP coming to hospital near you. Who works in an acute health care setting? Okay, so how have you seen CP? How has she seen? I can't go about 40, yeah, about 40, 50 so far. Okay, so it's, it's becoming more common. Okay, we'll, we'll see some data later for us um, where, where it's even more common than that, unfortunately. So MRSA is a thing of the past. Um, I'm sure you you see very few MRSA bloodstream infections now, which is a Great success. The same for C. difficile infection. It's gone down spectacularly. I think lots of antibiotic stewardship, lots of um, interventions, different than it worked. I think probably making the chief executive accountable for their rates of MRSA and C. Diff infection drove a lot of good things for us in terms of investment and kind of recognition of what we do. But the problem emerging now is antibody resistance in gram-negative bacteria. And it's really complicated and fiddly to get your head around. So you can see this is national data. Um, and you can see MRSA and C. diff are on the way down, whereas E. coli bloodstream infections, for reasons we don't really understand, are increasing. It's, a, it's an increase that we see locally, across London, across the country. And we don't really understand much about it, and, and we need to quite quickly, I think, begin to understand what are the drivers of these changes and where are the critical control points that we can intervene to stem that increase, particularly of E. coli BSI, but more broadly in antimicrobial resistant gram negative rates. Now it's a pretty it's a bit of an acronym minefield um, when we start talking about multi-drug resistant gram negative bacteria, MDRGNR, the acronyms just proliferate and it gets really confusing. And it's quite important, there's an infamous story now where a patient from the northwest was transferred to London and on their notes, clearly in red, on their paper notes was this patient has CPC. And the receiving hospital looked at it and said, well that's nice, and put them in the bay. So CPC was carbapenemase producing coliform, which was a local term for CP in this area at that time. The receiving hospital used a different term. So you know, if we get our outcomes wrong, we're not on the same page, that's not going to help us. In terms of infection control. MRSA, BRE, and C. diff, child's play compared with the multi resistant gram negatives, where we're looking at multiple resistance mechanisms in multiple species with the potential for community and healthcare associated infection, um, whilst retaining the ability to cause pretty nasty invasive infections to some more than others. And I would add to this actually lots of uncertainty about the epidemiology of these organisms. We don't really understand how they spread or where they come from or where they go to keep up. So taking a step back and looking at gram-negative rods in general, um, around about one third of all healthcare associated infections caused by these organisms, that ratio switches to two thirds when you go into the intensive care unit. There's two major classes, we have non fermenters things like Acidobacter, and then we have the Enterobacteria ACA. I don't know who thought of that, a bit of a mouthful, we can definitely do something easy to pronounce, um, which includes Eclep, your E. coli, uh, Salmonella, Enterobacter, and other enteric bacteria. So that is where you find your carbapenemase producing Enterobacteria ACA, or CPE. Some people talk in terms of CPO, so carbapenemase producing organism, which also comes from non fermenters like the acid factor. I tend to focus, and for the rest of the talk, we'll focus on the CPE, 
um, because it's a bit more of a defined problem. Whereas the absolute factors and the like tend to be problems in specific areas like ICUs. So this is a problem about our own making. It's a game cat and mouse, an arms race between bacteria and humans that there's only going to be one winner. So the NK bacteria ACA were tackled by extended spectrum beta lactam antibiotics, which prompted the bacteria to start producing ex extended spectrum beta lactamases, ESPLs, which prompted us to develop carbapenems, which prompted them to develop carbapenemases to chop up the carbapenems, and we're never seeing it. And that's about it in terms of drug discovery and drug development. There's stuff coming through the pipeline, there's more we can do. We can start augmenting existing agents with things like beta, beta lactamase inhibitors, but I don't see a genuinely new antibiotic on the horizon that's going to come along and rescue us from the plight of uh, resistant gram negative bacteria. So we're back to prevention is better than cure, which is where we come in. So to summarize the, the problem of these CPEs, I think it's a, a four pronged attack. We have high levels of antibiotic resistance. Has anybody seen a pan-drug-resistant CPE? Yeah. So, resistant to everything. Resistant yeah. to the yeah. 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 I mean, so what, what we do to that patient, we give them lots of antibiotics. An ID physician once told me that's more for the treating physician than it is for the patient to feel like you're doing something. Um, there are under-investigated synergies between antibiotics, so it's worth treating them. But we are moving towards the end of the road of antibiotic resistance. They also carry a high level of attributable mortality for serious infections. So if you have a carbapenem resistant enterobacterial ACA isolate compared with a carbapenem susceptible isolate for a serious infection in the ICU, you're twice as likely to die. So it's quite stark when you put it in those terms. Whereas for the non-fermenters, that difference is, is much more debatable. That there was a debate for a long time about whether things like acid factor had any attributable mortality. Whereas we don't really have that discussion for the injury about the ACA. We know that they can cause serious infections. We also have the problem of rapid spread, which itself is three-pronged. So we have the possibility of clonal spread, which is what we're used to. A strain of MRSA gets in, spreads horizontally around an area, and causes cross transmission becomes an endemic in the population. With the resistant gram negatives and the carbon penems particularly, we have the additional problem of horizontal gene transfer, where you get a plasmid mediated carbon penemase that can jump between species of enterobacteria ACA. Now, this is really difficult to understand and get a handle on from a practical infection control point of view. Do we, do we go for cross species transfer of carbon penemase? How can we be sure it's happening? And that just now is a frontier of our practice. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. And then also, yes? Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's quite common to have this kind of yo-yo between negative and positive. It's probably there all along in the background, but below the limits of protection. Okay. And cost, it's expensive. We had a 40 case outbreak of NDM a couple of years ago. We reckon it cost our organization a million pounds over 10 months um, with a mixture of actual cost incurred and a sort of um, opportunity cost, things like missed elective surgical revenue. So it's costly. So these are data from PHE, which suggests that we've had about 1,600 cases reported to the National Reference Lab in 2014. We know that's gone up in the most recent data, but I would say that's at least a tenfold underestimate of true prevalence. So if we look at admission prevalence, um, somewhere between 0.5% and 0.1%, probably based on published data, 
and multiply that by the number of emissions of the NHS, you're talking about 16,000 cases rather than 1,600. So I suspect there's probably a lot more CPE out there than we're currently reporting. Taking a very brief international view, and I'd like to say more on this because there's, there's lots to say about what's going on elsewhere with CPE. Um, in the USA, there was a study published years ago now, which is a real worry, suggesting that carbon pen resistance and Klebsiella jumped from less than 2% to more than 10% in a decade. Now, we don't know how many of these are carbon penomase producers, but to think that more than 10% of Klebsiella are now carbon penomase resistant in the US is a real concern. And similarly, there are parts of Europe where we know that moisture resistant Klebsiella in particular is a real issue. Um, Greece, we know, has got endemic antibody resistant bacteria, gram positive, gram negative, you name it. Perhaps more worryingly is the situation in, in Italy where they've gone from very little resistance not so long ago to very high levels of resistance. So a background starting point similar to ours, things very quickly got out of control in Italy. And it, it's difficult to get back to this gone. And to make that worse, this is resistance. A national prevalence survey showed that almost half of these isolates were resistant, which really begins to squeeze their immunity options. Okay, so there's been quite a lot of um, literature and guidance around the prevention management of CPE, uh, which is very handy, particularly the toolkit in the UK. Um, the next slide tabulates the studies that show us what works to prevent the transmission of CPE. It's really nothing to show us for a single intervention and say this absolutely definitively works to prevent the transmission of CPE. So we're throwing bundles of intervention at these organisms, some of which we know will be, done, will be redundant, and other parts of which are not included where they perhaps should be. So we need to work on the evidence base. And I think just a point of detail here that might be helpful for us is for the perhaps less expert colleagues in our organisations to understand that a guideline is not the same as a policy. So we have to take the guideline talk if you're going to build a local policy that's fit for purpose where you are. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the key interventions to prevent the transmission of CPE spread. Um, we've got things like active screening and isolation, antibiotic stewardship, hand hygiene, and kidney disinfection. Those are in black because I think that everybody you speak to would agree that you need to do all of these some of the time. There'd be lots, there would be lots of disagreement about when and where and how. The grey things are more controversial, even less evidence-based, and uh, some, some of them, people would say, don't go there, for example, on a quality screen, whereas decolonization of some kind, many people would say, yes, we should try to do some, some degree of decolonization. So, spending a little time on uh, screening for CPE. Um, what does a screening approach look like where you are for CPE? Who do you screen? Well, usual criteria, the information brought in the last year okay. uh, from our hospital work on our IUX and so on. Okay. Um, yeah. No CRE conversion is found. And what about high risk units, ICU or? No, the hematology is the standard so we've been done in digital coverage, but we don't target specific areas. And how do you define a, a hospital with a problem? <laughs> It's a real problem working out who has a problem to, to um, apply current risk criteria. It's easy for us because we consider ourselves a risk to see so that we screen all of our own readmissions um, and anyone who's had hospitalisation anywhere. So that's the view we've taken, um, which involves a lot of screening, but we think it's worthwhile. There's a paper that you really must read that was published earlier this year 
um, it's kind of complicated, it's model based, but the key conclusion is really helpful. Um, what it suggests is that small CP problems close to you within your own referral network are relatively much more important than distant problems far away. So for us, we know there's a major problem in Manchester. Um, whereas, so, so to focus on screening only patients from Manchester would miss almost all of our CP introduction. Because although the prevalence is much lower locally, the number of admissions is much higher. So when you do the maths, you'd have to have 100 times higher prevalence locally in order to address that balance, if that makes sense. But I highly recommend reading the papers. So how best to screen? Um, no perineal sampling. We know that that is nowhere near as effective as rectal swabbing. Um, rectal samples are the way forward, absolutely. Um, there are some taboos around this, perhaps for obvious reasons. But for me, it's just another anatomical sign. From a purely clinical point of view, no, it's better. It's an anatomical sign. I think that's the message. So we, we did a study looking at some of these drivers of um, compliance with the rectal screening program for CP. Um, we found that actually some interesting pre-analytical factors were important drivers. So for example, the decline rate by individual staff member or swabber ranged from 10% to 80%. So some people were getting almost all the clients and some people were getting almost no clients. We prompted us to look carefully at the message to patients. So the initial message that we were taking to patients was, we're doing a study on carbapenoate reducing enterobacteria ACA. You don't have to be involved, but if you'd like to be involved, this is what will happen. And I, I observed all of our team as they went down. And you could see that the patient switched off after the first or second syllable of carbapenoate. It just wasn't going in. When we simplified the message to talk about antibiotic resistant bacteria, a bit like I might say, and we made clear the benefits to the individual and to their peers, this would be good for you because if you have this organism, we'll know what to treat you with should you develop an infection. And this is good for your peers because we'll know you're a carrier and protect other people. Um, that really changed the uptake of, of the rectal screening dramatically, and the decline rate went from about 10% sorry, the climb rate from 90% early on right down to lower than 10% at the end of the study. So I think the messaging to patients and the staff is important for getting good compliance with screening programs. The guidelines currently recommend serial admission screens for CPE. Um, we decided not to do that locally for two reasons. One, because we've done some work showing that it doesn't actually improve the detection rate in our setting. And secondly, if you look at the number of patients in our cohort that actually stay longer than a day, it's not very many. So many patients aren't around long enough to even have two or three swabs, let alone get the result of an Okay, so very quickly on cleaning and disinfection. I'm sure you're all aware of this idea of the bed location lottery. I think it's really important uh, for us to understand and to be able to educate people. That in fact, if you're admitted to a room where the previous occupant had, let's say, C. diff or Acidobacter or CPE, then the chances of the next occupant of that same room acquiring an organism were increased. And that's due to residual contamination of the environment. Furthermore, we know that if we do a better job of cleaning and disinfection, we can actually mitigate or even take away completely that increased risk. So it's really powerful evidence for why we need to do a better job of cleaning and disinfection, particularly at the time of patient discharge. So cleaning and disinfection generally is not part of the science. Cleaning, decluttering, monitoring the process somehow, making sure there's clear responsibility for who cleans what. Um, and I think HPV or UV are now indicated for terminal disinfection following the case of HPV, uh, CPE rather. Um, so that, that's your sort of cleaning disinfection check checklist, if you like. Okay, to what stewardship? Clearly, this problem is driven by antibody use more than anything else, I think. I put a carbon and use across Europe. The southern European area is very much in red, with lots of use of carbon penance that we know is driving the problem. Um, we're not too bad on carbon penance use, and actually there's a, a sequin at the moment which is aimed to reduce carbon penance use, um, which I think will help matters. 
we found locally that actually we could forecast whether a CPE outbreak was going to happen based on previous use of carbon pumps. So it sort of squeezes the balloon of resistance out there and causes the, the carbon pump resistance to manifest if we use too many carbon pumps. And finally, this is some data from China, which is absolutely fantastic, showing the very short term intervention to reduce use of key antibiotics made a dramatic impact on the levels of resistance on the unit. So we can certainly do more with those kind of resistance. Okay, so I think we need to think carefully about which interventions to apply and when. We need to learn from each other, we need to communicate well, we need to probably communicate better. Um, in order to get on top of this problem this evening. And there I will conclude. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.